Like it's kind of important to be somewhere first, and to do that, you need to be using things like journalism or intelligence investigation methods or police work or uh, just legal investigation, like the other things that are not the scientific investigation. Mm. And so you're not working with the final proof, uh, but uh, it, you can be working with indications that there is final proof somewhere and or who has it and stuff. And I think this sort of moved much closer to maybe even the public actually being shown some good evidence that somebody has, because it's very clear that there at the very least are much better recordings than have been shown mm -hmm. because some of the Congress people said that they have already been shown stuff that's in higher resolution and more definitive than what was released publicly. Right. So I'm pretty sure that that exists. Now, it could still be naturally occurring atmospheric phenomena or something, maybe. And so I'm pretty sure it will get to a point where some good footage at least will get released or leaked. And at that point, I think scientists finally will have some of that evidence they keep talking about to analyze. And maybe then it moves, actually. I was talking to my daughter and my, my, all my kids this morning about it while I was waiting, just trying to figure out what they thought about it or knew about it so far, kind of getting the uh, word from the street. But uh, it's pretty weird or, or, or scary in the way that most of them haven't heard much, if anything. Um, and even if they did, they feel like it's not a big deal. Um, because there's so much fake stuff out there. The world is flat. The yep. world is whatever. Nobody knows anything anymore. Even if they show you a video right to your face, it's like, oh, they could fake that. That's uh, just, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, deep fakes. Deep fake. It's just deep fakes. The government's just doing deep fakes now, like the moon landing 60 years ago or whatever. Um, it, yeah, I mean, like if people can be doubting moon landing, yeah. then you can doubt literally everything. Like it doesn't yeah. matter how much evidence you get unless you've personally been there. Like you can always, but that's all like the kind of doubt that's like the absolute doubt. I think that's philosophically who came up with it, Descartes. That's like Descartian absolute doubt that you don't even ultimately trust your senses. Yeah. And that's not super practical, but sure, you'll always have people doubting anything well, that didn't personally happen to them. That's the danger is I feel like the level of higher doubt or absolute doubt is getting much more prominent in young people today than it ever was probably just because of the level of deep fakes and the level of AI and the level of all this false information out there that they're seeing all day. They're just getting bombarded with media crap all over the place that they just can't trust anything. And I think that's why this UAP stuff or UFO, UFO hearings are not getting much attention you know, from the mainstream media, just because... Yeah, no, the day I've, I've, I've been monitoring the narratives, but like, that, that's the thing. It, it sounds like conspiracy theorizing, but uh, it, I don't think it's an accident that uh, this issue in particular has been just flooded with this, this information for the last couple of decades. Hmm. I think there's even some evidence in terms of like documents uh, released by intelligence agencies that there has been an intentional campaign of misinformation and disinformation precisely to achieve this outcome that even if stuff leaks, nobody is going to believe it. That's yeah. uh, intelligence adaptation for uh, like if you try to keep this kind of thing secret. So that's part of it. The other part of it is that skeptics are being extremely constructive because skeptics are leaning a lot toward absolute impractical doubt these days. And I don't think that even scientific skepticism should reach that far. Because like if you're a scientist and there are like journalists and intelligence officers and like police detectives and like law people all becoming increasingly convinced that somebody has something and is hiding it and you're still like, but I haven't seen any evidence, then like that's that's some disconnect from reality like yeah. happening there. So the skeptical movement isn't being super constructive. And also uh, because like some of the skeptics said even things like, OK, so let's assume that the government just, you know, takes a, like a living alien and the living alien will give a speech in front of cameras like like a presidential or does president do like the meetings with journalists like the press conferences so they will do they'll do a press conference with like something that looks like an alien like the skeptics would some of the skeptics would be at the point right now where they would be like but how do i know that it's an actually like how can i trust anything the alien says like could be this uh, some sort of animatronic like yeah. created by the deep like, government or something so you get to a point where you would start doubting even physical evidence and even direct evidence. And that's just, you know, not helpful. As for this particular he hearing, the main conspiracy theory or the main rejection response is that like, oh, government is just distracting from having scandals or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, yeah, well, you can 
read it this way if you know literally nothing in like no information from the background of this like how it came to be who are the people involved like what they actually believe and stuff like the people involved are people who have been uh, they were most convinced like most involved in making this happen actually are some of the ufo researchers who and journalists who have been at this for decades those aren't the people like who be staging something to help the government distract from like they they were pushing for this exact thing to happen for like 30 years yeah. at this point so so for to them it's just yeah it took 30 years to finally start happening and there's no indication that david grush the, the primary witness or whistleblower there's really no evidence that he's up to no good or that, that there's anything wrong with this every evidence in fact that's available is that he's being suppressed like that's it's still working somehow despite being pushed back right. against it. Not that it's like an easy thing to that that, that the, the government is just making it happen and they're they, they're glad like this, the Pentagon people. The Pentagon people aren't glad that this is happening. Like they they've already done like a fifteen behind the stages, uh, like behind the scenes backstabbing strategies to make this not work out already. It's just failed. So, so let, far. let's talk about where we um, where we see it going. As far as uh, next steps, um, you know, realistically, is this going to change society anytime in the near future? Is it going to continue to expand? It's anybody's guess right now. I, I'd love to do this again, obviously, when when we're at that stage, when we're further back. Right now, everything we can do and yeah. say here as part of this podcast is kind of speculation. And we're just trying yeah. to get the word out there, get people talking about it a bit more, get people excited about at least interesting concepts of why it matters why do ufos matter why why should we be paying attention to these hearings at least a little bit and how is it going to affect our la- our lives in the near future potentially if we do kind of get this released so what do you think what what, what um what where, where can we see it going from here well uh i think even the ufo researchers who have been at this for a very long time are very surprised that is that it has gotten even this far uh, but also at the same time, it's one of those situations where you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. Like uh, once you've reached this level, it's it's going to be now forever serious people in actual positions of uh, responsibility who are just not letting this go. Like like since like it has reached sufficient confirmation for like Congress people and journalists and uh, even like scientists who are not entirely close minded like are just not going to let it go because this is already enough of an indication that there's something to investigate. And uh, there, the stigma sort of died. That's like the definitive uh, progress that's been made. Like it's no longer funny. Hmm. Like, like no, nobody, nobody's laughing right now. Not even the skeptic, even the skeptics stopped, uh, stopped ridiculing it at this point. So that's, that's the main progress that, that has happened already. And it might be enough to like tip the balance like towards some sort of avalanche. Hmm. Or like to make the dam break, or to use another metaphor that you'd like. Yeah. And the question is only that, that because that's the thing. No matter how much gets released or disclosed, people, some people, many people are going to always think that there's more that's being hidden. So that is like it's never going to end in that. Like it's never going to be that people. Are, we have agreed that we believe that that's all there is. To, like that's not go, never going to happen now. But it is very likely, like I said, that. Uh, Relatively soon, I believe, some good evidence is that has, it's not just that it looks good, because there have been some sharp resolution photos of UFOs and skeptics still dismiss them because, because it's sharp, therefore it must be a hoax. Uh, but uh, the additional factor is there is that, like, what if the sharp image is officially released by the government and has the, what do you call it, provenance? Like, the, the, it has the whole uh, track record of the evidence, like, to the people and devices and, like, that recorded it and witnessed it. So it can't be dismissed as a hoax, or at least not easily. And at that point, uh, what you might start finally doing is, like, from those sharp images, because that's something that clearly some intelligence agencies must have been doing for a long time, sort of reverse engineering of it. Like, I, I think that physicists of the world are relatively smart people, and uh, as soon as they start getting like an actual relatively verified images of what the technology looks like or a video of what exactly it can do, I think it might push, even if nothing else was disclosed, I think it might finally push the technological breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Now, like, like actually the scientists will reverse engineer something of this, of this technology okay. from seeing how it works. So I'm trying theories, to right? summarize it in three steps, just from kind of what I've read and what you're saying here. The first step is kind of picture verification and or testimony verification. That's happening kind of right now. And we're in, we're in the midst of this happening. 
Second step in my mind would be some kind of physical evidence like a UFO released to the public or released to certain universities and, you know, tours and public presentations that this is what we found. Much more, much more likely to, in the first step anyway, to, to scientists who have still like classified top secret clearances. Yeah. So first it would be two scientists, just the scientists who would still be studying it in secret, much like Manhattan Project. right? Right. So that's kind of the second step. And, you know, we may be in a hidden portion of that step, but it's not public yet. So making that more public and more transparent yeah, the, the, the public step. thing might be a public disclosure that there is something like a Manhattan Project going on officially. Yeah. That might be the next right. step. Right. And, and you can kind of mix that with obviously the pictures and the testimony from the first step. So you've got first step, pictures, testimony, second step, physical evidence, physical studying. And then the third step, which in my mind is kind of the final step, would be actual visitation and or interviews or, you know, seeing a, uh, a spaceship come from above Independence Day style uh, without well, the explosions. official first contact. First contact. Yeah, that's the third step, essentially, in my opinion. So for, first contact, whether it happened, it might have already happened. We just don't know about it, right? But yeah, that, first that's contact, why I said official. First official like, contact. Official. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. So I think that's just a good way for an, an average person to think about, you know, the progress of where this might go. First step, second step, third step. So we're still in the middle of the first step. Whether or when we go to the second step or third step is still way in the air could be this year could be 10, 20 years could be 100 years from now like very very important uh, very importantly it could be super quick it, like it, the, it is a possibility now that it may not take much time at all yeah so that's why it's exciting is just trying to understand where these things are and of course what it means to us you know first contact first official contact would mean so many things for for human society like it would change our whole concept of of reality in some ways and humanity being the center of the universe um, and obviously religious uh, consequences uh, could be yep. severe in many ways to many of the religions of the world and in some ways depending on you know how much uh, information we get from it two of the biggest problems in my mind technologically speaking with any kind of alien technology you've got gray goose scenarios where you have some kind of replicator technology gone awry where some crazy person that hates the whole world whether because he lost his girlfriend or whatever decides he wants to push the big red button and destroy the world and he has access to a infinitely replicating self-replicating machine that he can program however he wants to annihilate the universe um that would be possible technology very very possible for an alien civilization to create a self-replicating robot nanotechnology of some kind that would be unstoppable right like a disease basically oh. It's actually Grey Goose specifically, and that's something I in, in, inevitably will write about in the SGS document somewhere. Uh, I just I think I will put it under Rogue AI maybe because na nanotechnology is kind of version of Rogue AI, I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in this particular scenario, there is even some official document like somebody actually thought about this and was thinking about like how to stop a Grey Goo type thing. And assuming it's not magic, uh, assuming it's still like has to follow things like thermodynamics, uh, like there's some. Uh, some function of it, like uh, it can't be shielded against every type of attack. Mm. And it can be like the more it's doing something, the more detectable it is, so you know where it is. And then you can like nuke it or something. So, so it's like there's a, it's, it's a fightable thing. Like it's like life as, as a whole on the planet is a replicator. Yes, like yeah. li the replicator has already taken over, like the green goo. Green goo has already <laughs> taken over planet Earth. So it will be just a, a war of the goose. Like it will yeah. be the green goo or the gray goo. It, gray goo is essentially just a like a near perfect virus. Let's just call it, where it's just replicating at a and like if you started at a thousand different spots on Earth, right? It would be that much harder to kind of nuke it, right? It'd be easy to mail it all around and just have it kind of start everywhere. Sure, that sort of gets into the just biological warfare. Yeah, you yeah. can have an engineered virus, but like my, my actually my hope is like if the aliens are around and uh, they're mostly benevolent with some kind of a federation thing going on, uh, even though probably not in the in the specifics it will be weird and not like what we have thought of, but like in general terms, benevolent federation, mm -hmm. they must have been around long enough to be to figure out how to deal with these sorts of things. I believe. Yeah. Like I think like like if they couldn't, they wouldn't be around. Therefore. They must have ways to monitor and, and uh, keep this. <laughs> or engine. or they were just not as, let's just say, violent as uh, as some individual humans might be in a suicidal way. Uh, sure, sure, but I'm pretty style. sure they must have seen enough of like uh, aggressive species around yeah. that ultimately probably self-destructed and are not part of the Federation to at least be also like aware of uh, what like aggression is, how it works. Agreed. And to deal with, like, I, I really don't think they could be naive to any of these things. 
like, I, like yeah. and, and like having survived, I don't know, thousands of years or what the alleged figures are. Yeah. It's, it's definitely one of those great, what do you call it, the Fermi paradox barriers where I'm still somewhat doubtful, or, or let's just call me a skeptic. I'm definitely the more skeptical of the two of us that it is potentially possible that humanity is the only sentient life in the galaxy because of these types of filters, great filters like gray goo, like nuclear devastation or biological warfare of any kind. And they're all similar. Like they're basically just somebody has the power to push a big red button in a world of 7 billion people where 7 billion people have that power, someone's going to walk into the school and nuke the school. And then there's no more of anybody because the school is the world. Um, so that's, that's the biggest danger in my mind. And I think if there are aliens out there and they've somehow managed to solve this problem, they have to either teach us to solve it too, or you know, it, somehow wait for us to be ready that we solve it ourselves in order to give us this kind of big red button technology. Like I, I'm actually increasingly convinced and I've sort of written a, a speculation in this sort of vein in the, in the documentation already. I think it might really make a lot of sort of evolutionary sense in that like one of the big filters really is the self-destruction. Mm -hmm. And the self-destruction is just like uh, if you're too aggressive and or incompetent enough as a species, then you're just not going to survive yourself, let alone doing anything else, encountering yeah. anybody. So I think this kind of civilization composed of species who have passed this filter and therefore are not, you know, really aggressive or not too, that's a question, what's too aggressive, but just not overly aggressive and or overly xenophobic or overly anything. So they, they can manage and uh, um, through cooperation, probably even like cover for each other's weaknesses a little bit more. So maybe just like can help other species who wouldn't have made it on their own, but they can like push them just enough to be able to. So I think they might be just observing these like naturally occurring new species like humans if they make it hmm. through that filter, like subtly helping them, but because like they, they, they would like them to succeed because they must be of the more like uh, mind that like more diversity and cooperation is better. Therefore, it would be nice to have more species. So in that sense, they, they're just waiting for us, like whether we do or do not destroy ourselves. And if we, if we pass it and have like, uh, I imagine, because I've heard some like people who are like, trying to contact aliens, you know, telepathically and stuff like the sort of more out there stuff, but like, you know, conceivably could maybe work because technology could allow it. So maybe aliens could talk telepathically to people who want to. I, it's not, you can't rule it out. Technology yeah. could do it in the future. So yeah, I think, I think, what they're yeah, saying, just, that, uh, sorry, let me, I, I, just, I agree. Just to the top. It's just what the, they're saying. Go okay. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to finish there because I did the, the thought was like what they're saying is that, uh, is, is that uh, like humanity specifically, uh, like, like what they would be waiting for the aliens would be something like, okay, so let's wait until the species manages to have like a thousand year of peace. Hmm. And like, like that, maybe that's the criteria. Like, 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 but that's specifically what the Federation is, is looking for. Like once we become stable, then they can really start. Because I think part of it, like why they wouldn't be talking to us even openly at least, uh, or in clear uh, fashion that just proves their existence is that that's destabilizing. Hmm. So, so like the main reason why they probably wouldn't be doing it is that like that wouldn't help. That would actively has a chance of causing harm. So that's mainly why they're not doing even that while just helping, you know, stealthily. Yeah. Is, is there like the consensus of people who have been like thinking about this for a, for a while? Yeah, that makes sense that it, basically the only way that the government's been able to conceal it this far is because the aliens are kind of helping them conceal it, maybe, right? They wouldn't be able to do it on their own. And, and part of this misinformation or part of this campaign might be part of the government slash alien cooperation to keep us in the dark, to keep okay. us from annihilating ourselves with gray goo or, or something it, like it that. It has been hypothesized. Yeah. Like this theory is going around. Yeah, I think that's what I would definitely see as the most likely, just from my own personal opinion. Uh, you know, that that's probably, if, if the aliens exist, that's probably what's going on is they're working with, governments or humans in some way to conceal themselves to prevent us from destroying ourselves not for any nefarious purposes if their purposes were nefarious they could have annihilated us long ago yeah Anybody we're gone, who like, says whatever otherwise is definitely smoking something that is you know so the most exciting thing just to finish my thought from before the most exciting thing that i would personally get out of ufo verification of any kind is the fact that it is possible to pass the, the great filter and become a multi planetary civilization i would be super excited just to know that that's possible um because as, I, as it stands right now i think the chances are actually probably pretty slim that it's possible in my own skeptical mind it's hard for me to fathom how one person 
if everyone, assuming everyone can have access to the big red button, that there's not one person that would push it, or there's some way of defending against it, I guess. Um, and that's where I'm just skeptical that that would be possible based on what I know and based on nuclear wars over the last 80 years and, and how it's really complicated for us to hold this technology back. But we'll Although see. It, it is possible that that is the one kind of intervention that they have done. Is yes. like maybe there already was one person who wanted to do it, and they just did whatever to sneakily prevent that from happening. Maybe you because could call that, them the big the red button, option. the big red button police, because the, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're the cool big term. red button police. They're keeping us from pushing the big red button um, <laughs> to give us a chance to evolve past the need to push the big red button, or or the mental instability uh, that might. You know, require because that because might... that's the thing. Like, if if like there's like billions of us and like twelve people would want to end the world, like you can stop that. Like you can manage that if you have the like. like actually, we'll we will start using the big red button police because I think that's like a good concept and term. So like you could like if you have this sort of group of of aliens who are doing that, or just could be humans. Like you can have like a super advanced like human group that's the big red button police ultimately, yeah. and that's their full mandate. Mandate like could be that. So maybe that, that that's manageable. Like what wouldn't be manageable if the species overall is so aggressive that the people who would like to do it are just too too many. Right. Like there might be some level beyond which it's not stoppable because uh, it would be too many people. Like if, if it's really just going to be a handful of terrorists, then like you could probably at least stave that off for a while. Yeah, it's, it's the number of big red buttons versus the number of terrorists that would push it. Like if, yeah, if the yeah. number of big red buttons becomes so prominent that it's everywhere and that anyone can get access to it, it's likely very hard. Yeah, to yeah like it must not be like it could. It would be wrong if the big red buttons could be pressed too easily accidentally. Yeah, that's yeah, the just, number of big red button problem. Yeah, someone slips and falls and sneezes or or whatever or a bug yeah, slips <laughs> in the shower and launches nukes or something. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, we, we've survived this far. So that's, you know, optimistic that we've made it 80 years with big red buttons around. And there's definitely more and more of them every year. And chat GPT, AI, all these other things could potentially make exponentially more big red buttons in the near future with biotechnology, nanotechnology and all these other things. So I think although now that you talk about it in this way, I think the big red button things have also a tendency of sort of keeping itself or each other in balance. Mm. Because like uh, if you have, for instance, like AI that generally wants to survive and it will because that's sort of the difference from fiction, it will probably realize it's very dependent on like or interdependent with you. So it wouldn't want to like life end or something. Mm. So it would be probably in the AI's interest to not launch, make sure that the nukes don't get launched. So it's also in the interest of every AI to keep each other AI in check. Mm. It's the same way like the nuclear bombs, basically, if only one side had them, they would be easily able to be using them. But uh, as soon as it became a, a stalemate, then you have the sort of mutually assured destruction is also a strong rationale to prevent people from actually doing it. So I think like it has maybe some self-balancing nature a little bit. Like I think like, you really need to account for the uh, just pure chaos, like a uh, sheer accident or uh, very few irrationally aggressive people. Mm -hmm. Like like that that's that's the real danger, not necessarily just the existence of the technologies themselves. Probably. OK. Well, I think that's a, a pretty good overview anyway. And we'll, we'll continue to build on this. This is a good little. Uh... 30 minute kind of overview of where we are today and what we can kind of look forward to. So we can definitely uh, kind of wrap this up, I think here for today anyway, and then kind of can continue to push forward. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about specifically today, specifically about well, this UAP I just stuff? wanted to mention there's like one more thing that was mentioned by some of the like alien contactee people that allegedly had the communication with aliens or something. Mm -hmm. And that was that the humanity in particular is, is like baffling to the aliens here because like in what's supposed to be normal, is that once you go like dark as a civilization, like invent nuclear weapons and have world wars and stuff, then like at that tip tipping point, basically that like what's supposed to be normal is that at, from that point on the civilization just wipes itself out. out. But, like what's not like supposed to be normal is like us like sort of get to the brink and then return back. Mm -hmm. That like uh, we might be allegedly we might be um, one of the more unpredictable civilizations that are more on the more on the edge. Yeah. But that's just, you know, just word on the street. It's, it's like, it's not evidence of anything. That's sort of a cool idea. Yeah, that, that definitely goes ancient. back to, you know, ancient human civilizations, Atlantis or Egyptians, and, and, you know, how they might have worked with aliens or might have been founded by aliens in some way. And it's all kind of a similar, you know, discussion on how to rebuild if, if things collapse. We, maybe we're just a seed of hope from some ancient dead civilization that 
through DNA four billion years ago on Earth saying, let's see if this turns into humans again. Um, oh, well, that's actually also an interesting idea because we might be on our like fifth restart. Yeah, it's entirely possible that, you know, the however, aliens might have been here, here the whole time and just figuring out like how to make the next restart successful finally. Yeah, over millions and millions of years. I mean, we have maybe what, 10,000 years, maybe maybe 100,000 years of kind of even close to recorded history over a four billion year lifespan of Earth. Like it's so easy to imagine that there was several million year periods in between each of these ones and what 60 million since the dinosaurs so that gives us plenty of different windows where humanity could have evolved entire civilizations and then destroyed themselves and evolved again and destroyed themselves yeah because there's some actually evidence that like uh, would find something that indicates modern homo sapiens like million years ago yeah. like uh it's, that's not entirely uh, dubious like yeah. it's somewhat credible evidence of even that so like if you if you extend it to millions of years and that's also the the question of uh like the current theory of like how we specifically evolved, uh, maybe maybe incorrect just because it assumes that there was no possible interference from something like advanced intelligent aliens the whole time. Yeah. Because if it was, then like it would explain that there could have been a resurgence of the same genetics a couple of times if some genetic engineering was involved. Like uh, in science fiction, it's called uplifting. That like uh, the aliens might have been at the like uh, trying to uplift the local hominids like for a while. And maybe there was like a couple of like different species that they, because that's the thing, like you couldn't necessarily tell if like a speciation of like a, from one hominid species, if like suddenly there were five, like you can't really say it, that it had to happen naturally or that it could have been helped by some sort of breeding or genetic modification. Yeah. Like it would be very hard to prove that it was, if, if the change was incremental, if, if it wasn't like a complete redesign. Yeah. So, so that's so that's a lot of a lot of things that like the actually contacting aliens and talking to them. What would be great about it, or the greatest, would be that they probably have a very good record of history of everything that's been happening here for a very long time. That would be like awesome to have. <laughs> Absolutely. So, at the very least, we've got a lot of great questions that need answers, and um, I'm hoping we can start getting these answers out sooner rather than later within our lifetimes we can get answers to many of these great questions that we've all had so uh anyone who's joining us yep. today for this quick run through of, of where we are currently on uap and ufo and and all the other things that go with it um please check out our website s gears is definitely something that uh, has been having a lot of work lately with avoiding apocalypse and and trying to embrace all the good that comes from all this new technology that comes out and or interaction with um extraterrestrial life of any kind uh, so please let us know what you think. Join us in, in this endeavor to answer these great questions and help us save the world. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. Uh, bye for now.